It's haunting watching that footage in silence. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the United States heralded the end of the Pacific War and thus the end of the Japanese occupation of Korea. These bombings were momentous in their destruction of entire cities in seconds with a new and powerful form of weapon. And indeed, this was the dawn of the nuclear age. It's the event that sparked the race between the Soviets and the Americans to claim the Korean Peninsula. For Korea itself, the event turned liberation from Japanese colonization from a dream to a distinct possibility. But what it also heralded was a power vacuum. And in international relations, a power vacuum generally means uncertainty, instability, and often conflict as competitors race to fill the void. In this video, I'm going to chart the descent from post-colonial liberation to the horror of the Korean War. And within this, there's four key themes that I'll explore. The euphoria and the challenges of the immediate liberation period in 1945. The partition of Korea between the US and Soviet occupation zones and the UN Temporary Commission on Korea. The Korean War itself and the Armistice Agreement. And finally, I'll conclude by touching on some of the major legacies of the Korean War that have shaped the destinies of the two Koreas ever since. At the end of the Pacific War, Soviet forces entered the north of the Korean Peninsula through Manchuria, while US forces crossed into the south of the Korean Peninsula from Japan in short order after Japan's defeat. To fill the power vacuum after the Japanese withdrawal and to provide a stopgap solution to governing Korea, the American and Soviet occupying commands looked for an expedient way to administer Korea. So they're looking for a band-aid here. And they decided upon an arbitrary division at the 38th parallel. Now, there was no geographic, economic or political logic to this line other than immediate military expediency. And to be fair, they thought the division would only be a short one. It would only be temporary while a new Korean government was formed. But it was also clear that in 1945, neither, neither the Soviets nor the Americans really knew anything about Korea. And they didn't understand the grassroots forces that were coalescing around the arbitrary political division that they'd just created. The issue of installing a new government for post-liberation Korea was handballed to the United Nations. Now, remember, at this time, the United Nations is a very new institution. The picture you see here is of the UN General Assembly in 1947. And it's in 1947, in November, that the UNGA adopts Resolution 112, in which it calls for free general elections in both North and South Korea under UN supervision as an initial step towards inaugurating a unified Korean government. And it establishes the UN Temporary Commission on Korea as the multilateral body within under the UN umbrella that would oversee this process. So the idea is Korean people have an election, see who, see who they want to be the their government, their choice becomes the government. Sounds simple. In practice, it was anything but simple because the divisions around the partition ended up solidifying into something more solid. So the northern side straight up rejected this resolution and refused to participate in the election. They boycotted the election. Now, this election ended up being held in the South only on the 10th of May in 1948. And it resulted in the organization of a constituent assemb assembly and the establishment of the Republic of Korea government, which was proclaimed on August 15th, 1948. So this really is the election and the establishment of the Republic of Korea, the South, this is really the cleavage point where the political visions for a unified Korea in the North and the South diverge permanently. Because here you've got the establishment of essentially the architecture of a new state, 
but only half of Korea is involved in it. And that really solidifies the division. So why did the North choose to boycott the election? Well, for one, they refused to recognize the UN Temporary Commission on Korea, largely on the basis that they objected to the composition of the countries that were in the commission and that they argued that it reflected the interests of the United States. And in this stance, the North was backed by Moscow. But on the other side, some politicians in the South argued that the election shouldn't go ahead either. They claimed that the Northern boycott would hinder the reunification of the country. And they were ultimately proved correct. But nevertheless, the election did go ahead in the South under UN supervision. And interestingly, it enjoyed an impressive 95% voter turnout. And that's quite incredible as this was the first democratic election that was ever held for a national body in Korea. The result was that the arch conservative Syngman Rhee was elected president of the Republic of Korea. A month later, in September of 1948, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was proclaimed in the North under the leadership of the Soviet-backed Kim Il-sung. So let's have a look at these two new leaders. South Korea's new strongman, Syngman Rhee, was an American-educated Korean exile who returned to Korea to become its first president, or the first president of the South in 1948. As a young man, Rhee was imprisoned from 1897 to 1904 for his activism in support of internal reforms in Korea. So this is at the very, very late stages of Chosun. After his release from prison, Rhee traveled to the United States and attended Princeton University, and he became the first Korean student to receive a PhD in the United States. When he returned home, he participated in the Korean rebellion against the Japanese occupation in 1919. So that's the, the March 1st movement. When the March 1st movement was quashed, Ri again fled into exile and he didn't return until the Japanese were defeated in 1945. He was a fierce anti-communist, but he also ended up being an unpopular autocrat. So by this point, when he comes to power, he's approaching 70 years old. He's become quite conservative and ferocious in his anti-communism. In contrast, the new leader in the North is someone altogether very different. This was a young man called Kim Il-sung. So Kim was the son of a Christian preacher. He'd also been an anti-Japanese guerrilla fighter. He had a record of fighting against the Japanese in Manchuria, so he could not be smeared with any accusation of collaboration with the Japanese regime. It's said that he appropriated the name Kim Il-sung in 1945. So at the end of the Japanese occupation, the name Kim Il-sung was actually widely associated with someone else, with a legendary and possibly mythical guerrilla warrior who reputedly performed heroic exploits during an earlier period of the anti-Japanese resistance. So the latter Kim Il-sung, this guy here, it's said that he gained notoriety in the popular mind by identifying himself with this older cult figure. And his emergence as a leader in the North was actually surprising given his relative youth. And you can see in this photo here, his youthful face stands out. The Japanese withdrawal in August 1945 was greeted with euphoria across Korea, as we can see from these photos. We can see the Japanese flag being taken down at the colonial headquarters in Seoul and the US flag ironically hoisted in its place. We can see a street party in front of Seoul Station on Liberation Day. And we can see in another photo crowds gathering in Seoul to celebrate Korean independence on the 15th of August, 1945. However, that immense joy was also tempered by the grim realities of daily life in the post-Japanese power vacuum. There was a security vacuum on the street in the South, many Koreans who worked for the Japanese regime were rehired by Americans in a new police force. In the North, new village level people's committees were established to maintain order in the vacuum. 
So you've got two very different approaches to how to set up a, a new security apparatus. Then there are also population movements driven by a kind of ideological cleansing, which was moving both ways across the 38th parallel. So people that were considered too right-wing in the north were compelled to move or were attacked, and vice versa in the south. If you were considered too left-wing in the south, then uh, you were compelled to leave or were targeted for attack. There are also other population movements taking place at this time, with Koreans being repat repatriated to Korea from Japan, and also Japanese leaving Korea to return to Japan. So there's so many people on the move at this time. But the liberation from Japanese rule also meant the withdrawal of the Japanese economic network, which meant that daily subsistence was hard, was very hard, with food, clothing and consu consumables in short supply. So when life is difficult, and when life is uncertain in a society that's in rupture, partisan politics tends to take on a harder edge. The power vacuum opened a space for different local groups and different factions to press their claims. The nationalist leaders of the post-liberation period were united in their quest to establish Korea as an independent nation state purged of all traces of colonial rule. But there were many different ideas about how an independent Korea should be governed and who should govern it. In the aftermath of the Japanese withdrawal, there was a mushrooming of a, of a variety of different political organizations from across the ideological spectrum, including different organizations representing labor, peasants, students, youth, women, religion, and culture, all of whom were actively attempting to shape the emerging post-colonial state. Now, this was not a benign process. The raw trauma of colonization continued to polarize politics, and it was very difficult to find any middle ground in politics. The new post-liberation politics also pitted those who'd done reasonably well under the occupation against those who were discriminated against and suffered. There were scores to be settled, and there was no pre-colonial social order to fall back on for stability. The grainy photo depicted here shows Kim Il-sung speaking at a North Korean People's Committee meeting in Pyongyang in April 1948. Behind him, you can see the Korean flag, the Teguki, which is now the South Korean flag. And this event is important because this was the last time that this flag was officially flown in the North as a symbol of a unified Korea. So obviously around this time that the UN sponsored election takes place. And because that cements the division, you know, the South ends up appropriating this flag and the symbolism around it. The North institutes something else. It's worth thinking about the nature of this settling of scores that was happening at street level. Many collaborationists, as they're called, were attacked as long pent up antagonisms started to boil over. So the collaborationists were the people who worked with the Japanese during the occupation. And so after liberation, they were targeted for retribution. Now let's tease this out a bit. In an occupied state, not everyone is in a position to be a resistance fighter. During any long colonial occupation, most people do what they need to do in order to survive under the occupying regime. Some people found opportunity for careers and advancement working for the institutions of the occupying power, as many did working for the Japanese in Korea. Some people rationalized their cooperation with the Japanese from the perspective of transforming Korean society. So they saw the Japanese occupation as a vehicle for overdue social reforms and modernization for Korea. For others, working for the colonial regime was not that sophisticated. They were just looking for some a means of putting food on the table. They're looking for a job. In 2005, South Korea's Institute for Research in Collaborationist Activities released a report identifying 13 different categories of collaborationists, 
during the Japanese colonial era, including traitors, advisors to the Japanese government general, those who served in the imperial legislature, the police, army officers, judges, pro-Japanese groups, religious leaders, artists and cultural figures, media publishers, and war collaborators. So that's a pretty extensive list. Now, interestingly, individuals identified as belonging to these groups included many people who would later become prominent figures in South Korean society, including future President Park Chung-hee, as well as higher ranking members of South Korea's Chebol conglomerates, and a number of the founders of leading South Korean universities, as well as some prominent artists and intellectuals. Much of the ideological cleansing and communal violence that escalated from 1945 had its roots in people's relationships with the Japanese colonial administration. And there is a reason why many of the collaborationists ended up in the South. Another dimension of the ideological communal violence was class-based. On either side of the 38th parallel, land redistribution became a basis for class-based and pro-anti-collaborationist retribution. So this was the, the beginning of the population displacements and the violence. It was around land redistribution. While this was happening, a people's uprising on Jeju Island or Jeju-do in the south offered a prelude of what was to come for all of Korea later in 1950. Angered by police brutality, and angered by falling living standards, the people of Jeju began, began an armed insurgency against the US military government in Korea. Now this uprising was brutally suppressed and this remains one of the darkest chapters of South Korea's history. So all of the antagonisms are in place by 1950. You've got the superpower, antagonism between the US and the USSR. You've got the North and the South competing over who's going to be the legitimate government of all of Korea. And you've got everyday political struggle on the street and people settling old scores. So this is a tinderbox that's waiting to explode. The Korean War started on the 25th of June in 1950 with a North Korean invasion over the 38th parallel into the South. Now, righteousness often leads to hubris and overestimation of chances of success. And in this initial phase of the war, we saw hubris and miscalculation on all sides. So, for the Northerners, Kim Il-sung had the support of Stalin in Moscow, and they both believed that North Korea could swiftly overrun the Korean Peninsula, and that the US and the international community would not get involved. So their strategy was to take the peninsula quickly by force, and then compel the international community to accept, accept a political settlement with the Northern, North Korean government in control of all of Korea. Now, for his part, American President Harry Truman initially believed that the North Koreans could be quickly repelled. And he didn't bank on Chinese intervention in the war later on either. So like we see at the beginning of many wars, both sides of the conflict were overly confident of their chances of success. And there's also evidence to suggest that Syngman Ri in the south was just as keen as invading the north to unify Korea, but it's just that the north got in first. So as is obvious, Syngman Ri believed that the South Korean government was the only lawful government on the Korean peninsula. And on this basis, he was a passionate advocate for war with the north. Ri made it public that the South would be justified in taking every available means to achieve unification, including the use of force. So he's making these comments in 1948, 1949, earlier in 1950. So in September 1949, Ri openly ad advocated for a march north for unification approach openly stating that his government and the Korean people were prepared to fight for unification. 
On the 1st of March in 1950, so this is less than three months before the outbreak of the Korean War, Rhee made a similar statement to emphasise his willingness to march against the North to unify the country. So this, these public statements, it sounds like Sigmund Rhee is spoiling for a fight. Interestingly, though, despite this tough rhetoric, he didn't properly mobilise his military for a conflict. So was this foolishness or incompetence? Did he think that the threats would be threats alone would be sufficient to make the North back down? It is a brave move to make such provocative statements without actually preparing for war. Caught by surprise after the North Koreans crossed the 38th parallel in June 1950, Syngman Rhee ordered his army and police to murder domestic political opponents. As many as 100,000 people are believed to have been killed during this period in the South. These executions were supposed to prevent Southern leftists from reinforcing the rapidly advancing Northern troops. But it's also argued that Rhee devoted just as much attention to eliminating his political opponents in the South. By focusing on purging opponents and consolidating his power, rather than fighting the advancing North Korean troops, Rhee very nearly led the South to collapse. Now, the scars of this summer of terror still remain in the South. Many of those who were shot and buried en masse were just ordinary convicts or illiterate peasants who were wrongly ensnared in the roundups of supposed communist sympathizers. The truth about the summer of terror has only just started to come out since South Korea's democratization in the 1990s. South Korean conservatives, for their part, complained that this truth campaign will only reopen old room, old wounds from a time when, even at the village level, leftists and rightists carried out bloody reprisals against each other. So this is that communal violence, which was visceral on the street. Now, when we think of political purges, we usually look to North Korea. How, however, purges and political repression were also a feature of South Korean politics as well until the democratization period during the 1980s and 1990s. But back to the war itself. The initial North Korean invasion was brazen, it was rapid, and it was initially very successful. The North Korean forces advanced quickly, claiming almost three quarters of the peninsula. The South Korean forces and retreating civilians were pushed back to a small pocket uh, in the south of the country called the Pusan Perimeter, uh, an area around the city of Pusan. And the south was on the verge of defeat. This was a close call. Consider the fear and the terror experienced by the retreating South Korean military and the civilians. However, though, the rapid advance of the North Korean forces overextended their lines of communication and supply and left them vulnerable to a counterattack behind the front line around the Pusan perimeter. In the second phase of the war, American general and World War II hero Douglas MacArthur commanded a UN counterassault which landed at Incheon on the 15th of September in 1950. Now, because the North Korean forces had, forces had become so overextended in their rapid advance south, uh, they were really easily picked off once the Incheon landing had taken place. And the UN forces pushed them back just as quickly back into the north and all the way up to the Yalu River border with China. Now, this is where China gets involved in the war. This is the third phase of the Korean War. But it's important to note China was not an initial participant in the war. But once the UN forces had reached the Yalu River, Mao sent in Chinese troops. Mao had made the strategic calculation that China couldn't, ac couldn't accept US military forces on the Yalu and Tumen River frontier. And Chinese strategic thinking still concurs with this. This is still an important part of Chinese strategy today. And China was ready. Mao had mobilized 300,000 troops along the border in preparedness for the eventuality that the UN forces would reach all the way to their frontier. Once the Chinese entered the, entered the fray, 
they and the North Korean forces were able to push the UN forces back south of the DMZ. And from there, the front fluctuated back and forth periodically through early 1951. But by July 1951, the competing armies had essentially reached a stalemate, more or less where they'd started at the 38th parallel. Now, the Chinese intervention succeeded on weight of numbers, but not on combat preparedness. And there's a couple of reasons why this is an important observation. So, you know, if you know your Chinese history, you know that China had been, there'd been a civil war in China for 30 years, as well as the war against Japan. So uh, the Communist Party's army was absolutely exhausted after this extended period of conflict. They had a shortage of weapons. So many Chinese troops entered battle with farm implements or banging pots and pans. Uh, and also Mao's son was killed in the action in Korea. And that's something that, that is memorialized in China today. China wanted to ensure that North Korea remained communist and would act as a buffer between China and US backed South Korea. So this idea of the buffer zone, another important element of Chinese strategic thinking. The US, according to Mao, had also broken a promise that it wouldn't cross the 38th parallel. And so this was another factor in Mao's thinking about in favor of intervention. And also Stalin and Mao had met up in October of 1950. And Stalin had encouraged Mao to act quickly to stop the UN forces advance in North Korea. So there was a, a, a convergence there between China and the USSR that Chinese intervention would be backed. So this here is the aforementioned Douglas MacArthur, the leader of the UN forces in Korea. Now he's been critiqued with underestimating Chinese forces. So. Uh, in the UN's push all the way up to the Yalu River, you know, you could argue that that was a mistake. He'd also succumbed to a level of megalomania uh, and was actually removed from command by President Truman in April 1951. And part of that assessment of MacArthur's megalomania was his call, repeated calls to Truman for authorization to use atomic bombs against China and North Korea. And what he wanted to do was to lay what he called a strip of cobalt across the China-North Korea frontier to prevent Chinese forces coming into the north. And that essentially meant dropping a series of 26 atomic bombs along the border frontier to turn it into an impassable radioactive zone. Uh, thankfully, Truman never authorized him for that and uh, partially on the basis of that harebrained plan was one of the reasons that he was removed from command. So by mid-1951, both sides were essentially at stalemate at the 38th parallel. And then we enter a phase of long negotiations. So after many months of talks, an armistice agreement was signed on the 27th of July in 1953. So, and we can see the picture at the top of the slide here. This is a building which is still there uh, just behind the North Korean side of the DMZ at Panmunjom. I've been in this building. And this is where the armistice agreement was signed. And the actual tables and original copies of the armistice agreement are on display there. Uh, it's important to point out who the signatories were at the armistice agreement. You had officials from the United States who were representing the UN forces along with officials from China and North Korea. There were no South Korean delegates present. And this is why today North Korea insists on a bilateral agreement with the United States and not with South Korea because of who signed the armistice agreement originally. It's also important to note that the armistice agreement was an agreement to cease hostilities in no way is it a formal peace agreement to actually end the war. So the Korean War is technically still going on today. 
So, and any formal agreement between the US and North Korea today would likely have to contain clauses that also formally end the Korean War. So this period of time in 1953 is certainly pertinent to events today uh, in Korean Peninsula nuclear diplomacy. The Korean War left all kinds of horrible legacies. The human toll, the lives destroyed was catastrophic. So just if we look at the, the battle casualties, for UN forces, the South lost 46,000 troops killed. The US, over 33,500 killed. Another 8,000 US troops were missing in action. North Korean and Chinese casualty figures were even worse. China lost over 400,000 troops killed. North Korea lost 215,000 troops. The overall death toll of the war is estimated at around 5 million people and it illustrates the extraordinary impact on civilians. There were many atrocities committed by both sides, and so this was a vicious, fratricidal con conflict. Uh, and examples like the Shinchon massacre, which occurred in the north at the hands of South Korean and maybe American troops, or, or the incident under the bridge at Nogunri, uh, where the Americans slaughtered a bunch of Koreans. Uh, and there were atrocities committed by the North as well. There were families separated by division that, that are still divided today. And you see that with the periodic family reunion visits at Panmunjom uh, that occur when there's a thaw in inter-Korean relations from time to time. But there was also a loss of history. So large parts of Korea, including a lot of the urban areas, particularly in the north, were absolutely flattened by the conflict. And there's very few pre-1950 buildings that exist in Korea today, and particularly in the north. And that's because the north essentially had no air power. So the US had control of the air and just obliterated a lot of areas with bombing runs. Because of the division, the nation's cultural her heritage is also quarantined from each side. So, you know, important cultural sites in the north, people in the south can't get to and vice versa. But rhetoric aside, what we see now is that the millennium of Korean unity that existed prior to 1945, this can never be recaptured. Too much has happened now. So even if we do eventually get Korean reunification, the reunified Korea is going to be, be something quite different to the previous incarnation of unified Korea prior to 1945. Population displacements are also a huge part of this story. So if we look just at internal population displacements for a moment, and here I'm going to draw from the work of Wee Hung Shin uh, from their study in the International Journal of Korean Studies, the migration of North Korean refugees to the South was among the major migration streams caused by the war, as well as the forced and voluntary migrations of South Koreans to the North. Then you had the movement of South Korean refugees from combat zones in the middle of the peninsula down to the southern provinces, and then their subsequent return once conflict had ceased. So that's people like being forced to move down to the Pusan perimeter and then being able to move back after the war. During the war, the population of South Korea declined by nearly 2 million people. The influx of northern refugees into the south amounted to almost 650,000 people. 290,000 Southerners ended up migrating to the North, either by force or by choice. So, so those two numbers, that's the numerics of this ideological cleansing. But the redistribution of the South Korean population continued on a large scale, even into the immediate post-war years. With these internal refugee moments, you also had some pretty testy interactions between the refugees and residents of host cities. So imagine these huge refugee flows coming down to the Pusan perimeter 
and you've got the cities of Busan and Daegu and the locals like figuring out a way to accommodate all of these refugees in cities that were not at all equipped to deal with them. So you had the strained living arrangements combined with economic hardship and uneasy intergroup relations produced by strongly antagonistic in and out group attitudes. So this was a really difficult environment for internally displaced people. But also you had permanent migration out of Korea. Up to 2 million Koreans ended up migrating to the United States. And this accelerated after 1965 as well, after an amendment to US immigration laws, which allowed for a large proportion of Korean War orphans to be adopted by Americans and also by people in other countries as well. And you've also got significant diaspora communities in China, in Japan, and in Australia. Because the combatants are still technically at war, the US troop presence remains in the South. And over the long period of this uh, American occupation, a, a number of issues remain on the table as legacies. So one is about operational control and who is in charge of US forces in Korea. Now, originally, a lot of US forces were set up very or positioned very close in bases close to the DMZ as a tripwire. Now, what does the tripwire mean? Well, that means if the North decided to invade again, the first combatants that they'd come into contact with would be American troops. Now, by law, if American troops were attacked, this is by US law, that brings them into war. That would automatically activate uh, the ally agreement with the South and bring the United States into war to defend South Korea. So that's the political intent of the tripwire uh, that was meant to be a show of faith to the South to operationalize their alliance agreement. Now, more recently, American forces have been moved south of, to Pyeongtaek, which is about an hour south of Seoul. And operational control of US forces in Korea has been passed on to the South Korean military. There was also the issue of America's headquarters in South Korea. They originally based at the Yongsan Air Base, which was uh, around the area of Itaewon in Seoul. So this is right in the middle of downtown Seoul in a highly urbanized environment where millions of South Koreans live. Uh, so that, you know, that would have been a primary target for attack and would put South Korean civilians at risk. So that base has been moved to Pyeongtaek, the, the command center of American forces in Korea. There's also the cultural insensitivity of American GIs in South Korea, which happens anywhere where troops are stationed overseas. You get an accumulation of small justices by, uh, of, foreign troops doing bad things, small and large. And these injustices add up. And those antagonisms add up over the time to be a real irritant in the relationship. And part of the reason for that is because of what's called the status of forces agreement between the South Korean and the American government, which outlines the rules that American troops are subject to and the laws that American troops are subject to while they're stationed in Korea. Uh, and that means, so when American troops break the local law in the South or commit crimes, they're not subject to South Korean law. Usually what happens is just the individuals involved are just sent back to the United States or positioned somewhere else. So there's no sense of justice for the grievances that local people have for the crimes that American forces commit uh, while they're stationed there. Another important legacy of the Korean War is the DMZ itself and how the, this initial partition at the 38th parallel has solidified into a permanent boundary. This very solid manifestation of a divided nation. So what is the DMZ or demilitarized zone? So this is a four kilometer wide strip that goes from coast to coast along the armistice frontier. And, you know, it's ironic in its name, demilitarized zone, because it's actually the most heavily militarized frontier on earth. So this four kilometer wide strip, there's nothing in there but trees and animals and stuff, but it's also very heavily mined. 
So it's not easily possible to just walk through there because you step on a mine and blow yourself up. Uh, and on either side of this four kilometer wide strip, there's a huge array of military forces on either side. So this is not just a political barrier, it's a physical barrier, heavily fortified and movement across is almost impossible. It's also a psychological barrier. And the division of the peninsula that it represents colours almost every political issue on both sides of the DMZ. It's led to the militarisation of both North and South Korean societies. And it's also manifest in this love-hate relationship with unification. You know, when you talk to South Koreans, this is, this is really obvious. Everyone likes the idea of reunification uh, in theory and in spirit, but the pra actual practicalities of reunification are really difficult and perhaps unpalatable for some. The DMZ has also become a cultural barrier and you know, it's been over 70 years since this division and you, you're seeing an accelerating cultural divergence between North and South. Uh, and you can see that in the language, in the way that the Korean language is spoken and the words that were used, that are used on each side, how honorific language is mobilized in the, the Korean language of each side is slightly different. And the, the number of English and f other foreign words that have bled into South Korean Korean language uh, is much higher than what you see in the Korean spoken in the North. But if we're looking further afield for a, another legacy of the Korean War, it's the entrenchment of the permanent war mobilization and the permanent war economy in the United States, what's been called the military industrial complex. And the Korean War being the first conflict of the Cold War really enabled the United States to keep its World War II wartime mobilization in place and extend and expand it. And, and this has you know, become the springboard to America's global military footprint and US hegemony since 1945. So I guess I'll leave it to US President Dwight Eisenhower to have the last word on this. And, and this is an excerpt from his presidential farewell address from 1951. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. There are some patterns that we see in the partition of Korea and the descent into violence of the Korean War that are evident in other cases. So one, drawing arbitrary lines on a map to provide an expedient solution to an immediate problem often creates more problems later on. Also, temporary political arrangements can become permanent if there's no convergence of interests to lead to some new kind of arrangement. And finally, Political violence after liberation has been a common experience across many post-colonial states uh, as competing political interests vie for the spoils in, in the space of that power vacuum that opens up after the withdrawal of the colonial power. I've identified these as key themes from this video. These might be helpful for you as you revise for the assessments. Awesome.